Okay, so we're going to get started with a quick tour of MovieZoo's user interface. This is an easy tutorial. I'm basically showing you the ropes. I'm showing you all the buttons and kind of what they do in MovieZoo. So what I've got here is I've got a small window of MovieZoo running uh, against the dark grey of my PC's desktop background. And I wanted to make it smaller because there's some, some fairly cool new features about MovieZoo's UI that I want to make you aware of. The first thing you're going to notice if you're an old uh, an old MovieZoo veteran or, or an old user of MovieZoo is that things have completely changed. All the functionality is still there. Things just look and operate a little better and a little different, a little more differently. So, I'm going to take you on a tour of all these new things. So, if you're a new user, it'll be good to pick this stuff up for the first time. And if you're a, a an old or previous user, then consider this a tour of the new UI. So, I'll begin with the uh, most obvious stuff. Um, we're running in a Windows window. If you like, MovieZoo, untitled set, written across the taskbar, or the title bar rather, accompanied by the, the usual windows, controls to minimise, maximise, and close. Underneath that, we our nav bar, which used to float in the middle of MovieZoo, is now embedded along the top. And we've got a bunch of menus, which, reading from left to right, broadly represent the process that you would go through to make an animation in MovieZoo. From the creation of initial assets all the way down the tracks to the eventual production of a video. Alongside this, at the very end of this navigation bar, we've got undo and redo, and importantly, we've got the help right here, where you can watch our welcome screen again, uh, go to see pages of keyboard shortcuts, visit online tutorials, uh, go to the forums, and see all the specs about the version and the legal nonsense that has to ship. Uh, with MovieZoo. Underneath this we have the business end of MovieZoo. This is the white uh, set. In fact, let's make it something other than white so we can see what we're working with here. Let's put something on the ground and something on the sky. We've got a fully immersive 3D world right here. An enormous horizon an enormous landscape of possibilities. The whole thing can be navigated using the mouse and the keyboard on the mouse. And you can see, by the way, if, if I'm hovering the mouse cursor over the background, at the bottom of the screen we've got some helpful text uh, just to tell you what you should be doing to navigate. But basically, left mouse button drives it around like a car. We're, slight, we're holding down left mouse button and we're moving the mouse backwards and forward, left and right. Holding down the right mouse button and moving the uh, mouse is very much a kind of look around feature and the two buttons together can raise you up and down and slide you from side to side as if you were a spider on a, on a window pane. Of course you can also do this with standard PC first person control so W, A, S and D uh, underneath your left hand with Q and E doing up and down and We've also got stuff going on in the arrow keys, which is sort of slightly different. Um, mouse wheel will scroll you backwards and forwards too. Page up and page down does stuff. Um, it's all contained under the keyboard shortcuts option right here. Something else that's um, important for the 3D set is how you now turn on snapping. We've now got a snapping feature uh, right here, which means that when objects are created, for example this arcade machine, and you try to rotate them, you'll now find that it snaps to increments of 15 degrees, which will allow you to hit all the compass directions and all the important points in between. This is really useful for aligning objects in a complex set. I'd also like to point out while we're talking about complex sets, is objects can also be locked and unlocked. Let's lock this one. A little padlock appears. And this means that you can still access its properties but you can no longer move that object around. It's been frozen in place. And locking objects is extremely useful if you've if you've arranged a lot of objects in quite a complicated scene and you want to adjust one without knocking all the other ones over. To unlock it, of course, edit and unlock. Objects themselves can be manipulated and moved exactly with the same controls as you would use for manipulating and moving your own point of view around. So the left-hand mouse button 
allows you to slide it, right one, rotate, and the two buttons together allow you to, to lift it and drop it. To access an object's properties, you just click, right click over it, or with it selected, edit, edit object. Okay, next I want to talk to you about pinning and unpinning windows. And this is the reason why I've got a little small version of movies we run in. Let's bring up another window. Well, the options for this would be good. Okay, this is a big change to MovieZoo, and it's one which I'm sure the veteran users will applaud. MovieZoo can now, you can now move windows outside of the main MovieZoo UI. This means if you're running a two-monitor setup, you can put all the, the details and dialog boxes over on the second monitor and leave one monitor for just one big massive 3D viewport. Or it's also a cool way to uh, to just hide stuff off screen as well to clear to clear your scene of any sort of unwanted UI elements. All dialog boxes can be scaled and resized now, and you've also noticed that so can the uh, the main movie zoo window. I did want to talk to you about pinning and unpinning. This little button right up here in the title bar of a dialog box is pin or unpin. In its default state, MovieZoo's dialog boxes are unpinned. This means if you move the parent window around, the main MovieZoo window around, the dialog box, in this case the, the arcade machine's probably box, remains where it is. If you pin it by clicking this, when you move MovieZoo around, then the dialog box will follow it. Let's unpin it and close it. Right there. Okay. Let me tell you about ways to select objects. Now for this, I want to create some other objects. Which I can do simply by double clicking on their icon. Incidentally, now there's no need to go click and then create. We can double click on things. Or, I suppose what we can do is we can use the edit copy. Or edit paste. Or also control C, control V if you like your shortcuts. Let's talk about ways to select in movies. So you select an object by clicking on it with the left mouse. As much you do with every other program in Windows. If you want to do multiple selections, you're best to use the control key. So I can click once, twice, three times to get a multi-selection. Where if I wanted to, I suppose I could group those objects together and ungroup them when I was finished. If you use the shift modifier once, twice, what movies you tries to do is find all the objects in a line between your first and second click as it did here. Click once here, click twice with shift over here and we get everything in between. And that brings me on to the scene window. Let's just make this a little bit bigger so we're capturing more detail. Let's go to view scene window. Now the scene window is a handy little inventory of all the objects you've got in your scene. Um, we can unfilter it, we can select all, we can see we've got arcade machines. We can also filter it, we can just show me objects, just show me cameras etc. And you can select things from this window and you can also go into their properties as well. MovieZoo will tell you about your current memory usage. I've got quite a, a decent PC here so we're only sitting at 12%. Once that creeps up to danger levels, MovieZoo will give you a warning well in advance and advise you that you might want to be shutting some things down or saving your scene. Let's delve into the properties of an object. I can show you some other cool things that's going on. Right click. So this arcade machine, you can see that everything now comes with a numerical entry box, which is pretty cool. You can copy and paste between them. You can also type in exact values. Um, we've got spinners to go up and down by increments. We can also middle mouse wheel up and down numbers or up and down sliders. Uh, what else we got on? This can all be resized. Uh, some quite cool things can be done with the color picker now as well. So see this yellow color? Click and drag it and you can share colours around objects, pull the black across to there, the black all the way across to there, we can now click and drag between things. Let's go into the colour picker, let's click one of these colour swatches. It brings up the colour picker. I'll try and arrange my boxes so that we can still see that arcade machine, and we'll delete these ones just so that the scene's not that cluttered. Keep your eye on this arcade machine right here. Here's our colour picker. What you can do with that is you can pick colours to be used. Now watch this. If I go pink and then halfway down the value scale, so we've got a kind of pale pink going on, by left clicking around this spectrum, you can see that our choice of colour remains 
where we first selected using the left click to go around the circle. If we right click it immediately snaps to the brightest, boldest, most saturated colour that we can get to. That's not something you'll find in the docks. You can also take colours from this here and drag them across to customise your colour palette. Indeed you can take any colour from this colour palette and move them around to create something that's custom to your set. Colours can also be defined with RGB and hue saturation and value. Sorry, I should have said that's red, green, blue for any of the novices. And we've got this cool addition to the UI. We've now got an, a, a colour dropper tool. So we can now left click and drag over and it's going to sample all the colours that are underneath it in the scene and update your object accordingly. One thing to say about the colour picker is that it, it is actually sampling the colour underneath it. So you can see that we're getting different types of brown just by mousing over the sort of shadow areas of the object. Okay, let's close this down. I want to create another camera, show you something that's also in our UI. So now we've got two cameras and I better show the camera window. There it is. Sometimes in a complicated set you can lose your cameras. They're grey, they can get behind things, they can get inside things. A cool way to find them would be, see the, the little viewport? If you right click on the viewport, it will take you to the camera in question. That's quite cool for when you've got things that are going, that are, you know, quite complicated. Now what else have we got going on up here that's worthy of mention? View unlit mode, that's quite cool. Switches off the lighting. You get quite a nice sort of uh, shaded effect without any shadows other than the ones that are burned into the objects. can give quite a nice effect when you're rendering your final movie. I'll switch lighting back on. And that's pretty much a tour of the user interface. Uh, get in, have a play with it, practice, mess around and if you need any trouble or if you meet any trouble and need any help at all then uh, post a question in the forums and someone will get round to answering it.